Um, in this panel, what we'll try to do is we'll try to quickly go around all the speakers and get their point of view on some of these ideas. And then if we still have the time, we can open up and get a few questions from the audience. So uh, without any delay, I'll um, request uh, Shabani to speak first. Uh, Shabani has had a long career in um, visual effects. Uh, and then for the last eight odd years, she's a, been at Jamia Millia. Uh, and currently running a program, which is a two-year master's program in visual effects and animation. So I'd request you to perhaps start with some observations from that. OK, so uh, we don't specifically teach comics, but we teach sequential storytelling. And one of the biggest problems that we have is uh, our students are people who don't necessarily come from an art background, or some, some of them have a deep, deep fear of drawing. So uh, uh, when we begin from there, you know, uh, starting from, say, drawing being an essential tool of observation, of record, of interaction, it's um, what I'm finding when, when we talk about can comics be taught or can any kind of storytelling, visual storytelling be taught, is fighting this fear. And um, increasingly, I mean, I've, I have just eight years to look at, but I'm looking at the digital native who doesn't want to draw at all, not even on, uh, unless it's with a tablet. So uh, we, we are starting from this point of how do you have continuity? How do you have believable characters? How do you have a background that you can even connect to? or connect to the character, if not to the audience. So th that has been, that's one area which I'm very concerned about when, when we talk about can comics be taught. And uh, I'm moving on to Priya now because we've, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I think no, we'll move to Shekhar first. Oh, okay. So yeah. from there, <laughs> sorry, that's powerful here. <laughs> uh, so we'll move on to another experience, which is uh, introducing the comic book into, uh, you know, into a very, um, I must say, I mean, uh, the animation film program in NID is, is, is quite solid and, it, and it's old. I mean, it's been around for now, what, more than 20 years? Uh, in, in even in the postgraduate level. So some insights from there, perhaps? Yeah. It's been there since 89, formally, 1989, and it started with, as a postgraduate program. I also accidentally landed there because uh, after my graduation in commerce, like dealing with finance, how to hide the black money and all these things, I landed into this black humor. And, uh, and then uh, I came back to my school because I had a eight years of turbulent ex experience in industry saying that you can't draw like Disney, you can't draw superheroes and all these things. So I said maybe I'll escape because I largely I was a failure in the industry. So, I mean, NID was generous. I went back there, partially there. I came to know a little bit of potent talents like Priya and all, like they are taking these you know, challenges forward and brave stories they're telling. And perhaps what I feel that 2002 I joined back in 2003, I got a chance to coordinate the department. So I said, okay, that's it. Let me uh, kind of vandalize the curriculum. So. I insert, you know, uh, 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 more of a, a game of soccer into it, you know, because theory is one thing, of course, is important, but end of the day, the practice is also important. So, and then animation, in our program called Animation Film Design, and it is not animators training program. Industry brought a lot of outsource pressure, so everybody want to make a portfolio, and because you can earn in dollar or euro, so it's nice to be rich and all these things, no problem. Delhi Smog is telling us about this. And uh, what happened, this curriculum I inserted formally in 2003, comic book as a course. Of course, I had to fight it out. And since then, it is running, and that brought the opportunity. I mean, it's like a lot of backstories, in short, since it's seven minutes for each of us. And seven minutes was the early term of animation shots in America. So these seven minutes, I'll try to tell you that it sustained and it gave a chance to the lot of young students that they can tell a story directly. All they need piece of carbon paper and some pencil from the dustbin. They don't need big machine. 
and that becomes successful. Pierre had some experience of coming to our school to do a workshop, and later students can choose. It, it, it's, it's a very elective model. So, do you know, I feel that it's my experience looking back, uh, you facilitate, you propose, and you also do certain things, you know, along with. And then, uh, constantly, you have to reinvent. You know, it's not easy, but it's like playing football. Yeah. Uh, on that note, we can come to Priya. Fortunately, I don't have to introduce you. That happened in the last session. But um, we were speaking about how you've done a lot of workshops because both Shaivani and Shekhar are coming from very formal spaces of education, right? Yeah. A master's program, a postgraduate, undergraduate program. But what has been the experience of taking this into... Well, yeah, my experience with any kind of teaching, if I may say so, <laughs> is uh, basically through these uh, you know, short workshops. Actually, I, like many other things, I don't know if anything can be taught at all. You know, it's mostly, it's mostly about creating an atmosphere. And if you have the right atmosphere to kind of, uh, uh, where people are sort of free to express themselves without, uh, without the fear of making mistakes. Often with comics, uh, whenever I've sort of started maybe a workshop, uh, the biggest, I think, the fear is that they're going, that somebody is going to make this huge. This is their magnum opus, you know. That this, this first thing that they're going to do is their magnum opus. So you have to kind of, you know, I, I guess, make them think comfortable that you, you might, you, you. This is not your you know, first and last thing that you're going to do. Uh, so that I think that at atmosphere of mahal, as they call, you know, in Hindi. Uh, is uh, is really important in uh, in a teaching program because at least even in, in NID it was most it was a lot of peer to peer learning uh, more than and you sort of uh, went to you went to your guides who would never give you the answers I'm sorry Shekhar you were my guide <laughs> but you know there were no there were no there were no answers but yeah. but you. But we had conversations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were no right or wrong. So, no right or wrong. Yeah, I didn't tell her that this is how you should draw your yeah. mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so on that note. Yeah. <laughs> no, but let me just, uh, let me just uh, ask you to just comment on one more thing. I mean, um, you know, this idea of uh, teaching in a formal setup is something that we've uh, dealt with. Uh, I'm very curious that when people have come to some of these workshops yeah. that you've attended, what is the imagination that they've come with? Okay. And has anything changed in that imagination? And I'll tell you where I'm coming from. A large number of us, when we look at a book or we look at a film, the first thought is, this feeling of intimidation, you know, that, oh my God, yeah. you know, how do you do that? So how do you break that down? You know, how do you break that down to saying that, okay, there has to be a story and you have to locate yourself in it. Yeah, so, so if you uh, could... Well, if I can give you an example of, uh, uh, there was this workshop we did with Zuban and the Goethe Institute and uh, we, uh, Zuban came out with a book at the end of the day and there were three resource people who were le uh, leading a bunch of, uh, I think there were eight, I'm sorry, this was like, more than I think four, eight, uh, 10, 12 uh, female artists. Uh, so, uh, so again, so like I said, we were create trying to create an atmosphere where you know for the for 10 days we kind of only concentrate on comics. Uh, a lot of the people who had attended this workshop, uh, some of them were not even illustrators; they didn't draw at all. But uh, as I think even Shekhar mentioned, that you don't. Uh, it's about communication. It's not. Uh, it's not about just a good drawing. Uh, of course, a good drawing is a skill that you can kind of, you know, attain over a period of time. It just needs it needs practice. And uh, but if you're somebody who is interested in telling a story, there are ways of you know uh, using comics to tell a great story. That, for example, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, there's this guy. This is the person who reviews uh, films, uh, and he just uses stick figures to review these. Yeah, visual idiot. Uh, so he he uses these you know stick figures to do these reviews of uh, film scripts, and they're really funny. Mm. And uh, he he manages to communicate very well through that. So it's it's a lot a lot is about you know f trying to find your language, uh, a language in which you are comfortable, or a drawing style in which you are comfortable. And you I I think as a mentor you kind of try and recognize that. In the person, try and try find, kind of bring, yeah, try yeah, bring call that, that out. Uh, yeah. out. Sure. Yeah. Thing. I think the problem also lies with a long culture of uh, 
drawing Michelangelo. So that creates heavy pressure on students and just to unlearn is very important. And it, that's the biggest job, you know, like, uh, and then you tell them that this is the handwriting, that you just, you just communicate with your handwriting, like Altamira, you know, those cape paintings. Yeah, that's it. I think this is a good note to kind of move to Bettina. Uh, to introduce Bettina very uh, briefly, she's a, she's a comic artist herself. She's published various comics, and currently she's uh, doing a PhD, which is also around the comic book. But uh, there were two things that we were conversing on, which I'd uh, request you to comment on. One was the idea of the comic book, you know, and, and you know that sort of individual relationship with the book in the making you know, and, and uh, how that as a culture perhaps, and I think Shaibani was also briefly alluding to it, you know, that, um, you know, how, I mean, are we losing that connection? And what, how does that then extend to this larger art practice, you know, that, that you've been speaking of? Well, actually to come a little bit back in time to explain you how I came to this uh, uh, attention for the comic book in my courses at the university in Salzburg is that actually I, I've lived for about 10 years in France, well more actually if I counted, <laughs> and uh, in France where well, comics are really part of the everyday culture and uh, so uh, I came back to Austria two years ago to start my PhD studies and uh, I took really a lot of things for granted actually which uh, I found out that in Austria you cannot take them for granted because people have not grown up in the same uh, stance with uh, comics. And uh, I, uh, I'm doing courses with uh, students of German literature. So they have a very particular background. They basically, some students didn't really know how to read comics. I mean, they, they know how to basically, yes, of course, to read the text and uh, go from the left to the right. But they couldn't, uh, they just saw the images like a support of the text. And uh, like uh, not as uh, the image layer. Uh, the visuals having a language of their own. Yeah. yeah. And that is uh, that has a narrative importance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was thinking about uh, a way to to make them aware of uh, of uh, the potential of uh, and uh, the meaning uh, and the sensuality of the of this uh, image level of the iconic level in a in a comic. And so for, for me, uh, going, uh, starting from the book as a concept, as a whole, was, uh, well, was a way to, to make them connect with, uh, more with this uh, comic culture because, well, even though they are literature students, they have this uh, book culture. That's something they can really connect with. Mm. And uh, so I, I try to focus really on independent comics, where you have this strong focus on the book, on uh, one author who really creates the book from, uh, from A to, to Z, from uh, the story, the images, and really the book design, like choosing paper, uh, weight, and choosing the format, and uh, really designing everything uh, as a whole. And uh, that was really a way to, to approach the things differently and to, to focus on the handmade, like, uh, well, uh, comics where you have not only, well, the drawings, obviously, uh, handmade, the text, and, uh, and uh, sometimes even the cover, actually. I had some comics where the cover was uh, drawn, well, uh, printed by hand, mm. and uh, stuff like that, to make them really change their perspective and um, it's really, I, I think for, for me, uh, comics really live on this tension. Comics are reproduced, of course, on a, on a more or less uh, big scale, but they always have this handmade component which makes them uh, something very sensual, where you can really have a different relationship than with other books. Uh, great uh, way to move into Pierre. I mean, Pierre, to introduce you again very briefly, most of you may be familiar with his work, is the director of the illustration department at uh, the Luzon University of Applied Science, Science and Arts, uh, the School for Art and Design since 2002, uh, where uh, he has been specifically teaching illustrations. So when we are speaking of, in the context of the book, the author, what Bettina was telling us about, one of the things that we've 
also been talking about is that is authorship something that we can actually teach? Uh, would that be a good lead for you to start? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure. <laughs> if you really can teach authorship, I'd rather inclined to say no. I'm part of the Department of Visual Communication, but I think comics is definitely not visual communication. It's visual thinking and it's visual language. When I started this job, I came there, had no experience in teaching, except for the fact that both of my parents were teachers. And I think when I applied for the job, they thought that was a joke. Uh, so I got the job. But <laughs> so I learned on the job. And had just the feeling I wanted to do something that comes from practice. And I had the chance I could invent everything from scratch. Because before it was an art school, it was they called themselves picture makers, but they did not see pictures as a language. Now, maybe very briefly, picture drawing as a language means for me, it makes me free, it frees me from everything because it no longer has to be good or bad. I no longer have to say it's drawn well or it's drawn bad because it's just, what do you want to say and do I understand it? So the first thing is perhaps, what do you read? and not is it good or is it bad. Makes it much more simple to teach. So basically I can invent my teaching with the students together because I do not really know. My best teaching instrument is the class. They learn very much from each other because you mentioned it. You go out and you start school as a fan. You read comics, you watch comics and you think, ah, that's so cool, I want to be part of it. But will I succeed? Ah. You don't know. I didn't know. I was not sure. I started as an engineer. It took me three months to realize that that's not it. So I go back to drawing. I'll try nonetheless. And now I've lost. <laughs> maybe, flash, maybe two or three words to how we conceive it. The first year when you enter, most students enter school and expect to learn a few tricks. And they have this notion that if they are good at drawing, they will have a happy life. Uh, that's the first thing we destroy. So, <laughs> The other one is, will I earn money? I think that is something you cannot really say because we always look at things that are successful. It's a little bit like if you go in an old Catholic church, you find a lot of pictures where people thank St. Mary or somebody because they have been healed, prevented from an accident or something. But we have to be very aware that nobody that is not healed and the people who die, they don't make pictures. So you don't see those. We only look at success. Second year is how to apply it in different media. We are very concerned with media because we consume media and I found out that a lot of my students, towards the end of their studies, they wanted to do books. And I said, that's nice, but why do you want to do books? I never see you read. Do you really read books? And some said, no. I said, so why do you want to make a book? You can't do anything that you don't like doing. And so they started trying new formats on iPads, on iPhones, because that's the media they use. And visual storytelling, I think, is something too strong. It's like a force. It will find its new way, its own way, into new media. But it's, can I teach it? I think I can enable a laboratory. I can enable experiences. We can test things out together. But I'm not sure if I can teach it. What I can teach is maybe the confidence that you should fail. And next time you fail on a higher level. That's my understanding of teaching. So perhaps uh, Shekhar could just tell us a little bit more about what we were discussing in terms of that mentorship model, you know, I mean, because I think all of us are somehow alluding to it, you know, this environment, this atmosphere that Priya was talking about. Can I just say yeah. That one thing which just takes off from, I was just reminded of something uh, when Pierre was talking about how his, uh, his students are drawing on an iPhone. Um, so we, we were trying to teach our students how to create characters and... Um, Nobody came up with really very believable characters. That was, in fact, part of one of uh, Priya's workshops. But uh, say three or four semesters down, we had uh, we offered them a gaming elective, and some of the students came up with the most extraordinary characters in games. So we learned, we learned 
you know, you start off trying to teach something, you end up learning something else from them. So they're driving that course now, I'm not. So uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps what we could uh, also talk about very briefly is that what is it, you know, let's say if we take the example of NID, is that what is it that are, what are the things that are driving people? I mean, like for instance, Shaibani seems to feel that gaming is a zone that is emerging. Because we, uh, in the context of what we said, no, that this is also a kind of intermedial space, you know, it is, it is sort of sitting where a lot of our friends have gone on and done a lot of storyboards for films. A lot of them have gone and done a range of work with that core training. So if that is something. I don't know. I mean, um, my personal narrative of being with NID is my narrative, which is relatively truthful, but half lie also. Uh, a very confused person I am, and more I'm getting confused with that things are bringing more challenges. And that's why I encourage being a mentor that I'm also growing over the years, you know. Often we have this mistake of that teacher will teach the same old thing. Like in Calcutta University, they still teach uh, revolution in Soviet Union, where Soviet Union doesn't exist, yeah. And of course, today's student will say, I mean, where is Soviet Union, Do you know, like. So, so I think it's, it's like playing football, that's what I'm saying. Only thing, the magic happened in NID is undefined, and it's human interaction. And it is like what you see in Facebook. It is so uh, notorious. Like, do you say something? Someone will say something. You know, like, and smileys are coming, emojis are coming. Everything is part of that most primitive expression of making faces, graphic narratives. So this is something I feel I am personally excited about. And I really grew up with uh, looking at the failure side of it. And that is what sharing with the students, that taste the failure. Because we, we immediately reach there. And then there is a misconception that students often think that, OK, if someone comes from DreamWorks, they will teach me the ultimate thing, and you are obsolete. Yeah. yeah. But it changes over the period of time. The whole idea of comics in an education institute, in NID, it works so far. Not entire students, but maybe out of 15 students in a class, two, three students will take comics and take it forward. Yeah. yeah. And then some of them, like Delvin, one boy, very talented, bright boy, he did a comics from his, and what I encourage along with some of our other colleagues, those who come from outside as a visiting faculty, some of our alumni come back, like Priya came after many years gap, and then many other people, uh, they bring their bag of experience. And our job is very exhausting because you keep on mentoring and hoping that they will be brave enough to tell their story. Because biggest challenge in India is we are still not telling our own honest story. It's in pockets. It's in pockets. And that also, um, uh, the lucky one who is getting blessed, kind of an opportunity to tell and encouraged yeah. and promoted and supported. So that gap is there. But end of the day, yes, comics can't be taught. It is purely uh, an so individual that's, interest. That's, that's yeah. unanimous. It can't and, be. and it is purely <laughs> the, you know, you just kind of encourage them and tell them that, you know, taste the failure. And NID is somewhere happy accident. It's still not being objectified completely, even though there are grading system and all these things are coming. There are push button thing is coming. Multiplication is coming. That's again another comics. So yeah. I don't have let any me answer. Let me just yeah. pick one word out of you and, and, and take that as a cue to move on. Uh, the word that you use was mainstream, because one of the things that's coming out of all of us here is that perhaps at the moment when we come into a formal space of learning, the the, the the sort of exposure that we have is to the mainstream. But then suddenly the challenge is uh, to move from that space, you know, whether it's the published book or the, or the film or whatever, to asking those really tough questions to yourself, you know, that what is the story I have to tell and how will I tell that story? So um, Bettina, Pierre, would you like to take that? Because you also had, you know, comments about, you know, this sort of, you know, this sort of claiming this space Priya, I mean, whoever, I mean, this is open to all of you, you know, that how do you, how do you sort of appropriate claim, you know, f and then feel confident with that space, with your form, yeah. I just want to say one last thing about this, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of taking advantage of the mouthpiece, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, two postgraduate students in recent past, uh, one boy came from the Bombay slum, he used to stay in a slum, hardworking boy, his name is Rajesh Thakre. And he made a personal story of the trauma they go through about the common toilet and 
and that common toilet is also ruled by the local mafia. And, and that's why people go to the both side of the local railway track for whatever, the universal toilet project. So uh, that's, that film they made with, you know, using super technology, After Effects, 3D, this and that. But at the end of the day, what touched is the, the honesty of the story. It came from his uh, the deeper most, that stigma, you know, which was happily he released. And it was absolutely dark humor. And that become an example for many generation of students. And that is end of the day happiness for a mentor. Uh, I think uh, what we look at, and we also learn from them. You know, it's a two way because generally, uh, it's a concept of our culture that teacher will tell everything. So I have to get the pass marks. I have to please my teacher. So that culture also continue for quite some time all over India. NID is again somewhere survive because of this culture of happy accident. You know, human interaction. Subversions, subtext, you know, cross culture, knowing uh, micro India, you know, it's, which is still undiscovered. So one has to experience to come to an ID uh, to experience that, you know, what is the thing works. Like you, know, you see peacocks and camels and BMW and iPad, everything there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, like uh, telling people to be honest about what they yeah. know and write, write or draw that. I mean, uh, it, and let people who live the story uh, tell it themselves. Mm. Uh, I think the best stories would come out that way, that way uh, perhaps. Maybe then. No, okay. <laughs> One last thing, Pierre. I'm sorry. I'm a very, very ill mannered person. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> Once a group of students asked me what software you use to do comics. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, I just thought that I forgot to answer your question yeah. about authorship. No, well, I somehow uh, the queue drifted, was, uh, drifted off a little bit. I was talking about drawing as a language. And you were talking about mainstream. Yeah, I mean, how does this whole, how do you sort of reconcile, you know, this, this aspiration that the mainstream yes, creates for you? I would just you. want to say maybe two sentences regarding to this. When people come, they have certain ideas how something should look. And I think it's absolutely okay to have conventions. Conventions make it easy to express something, but then your thinking goes within this kind of convention. If you draw superhero comics, there are certain cliches you have to fulfill. It's very difficult if you go outside, then it maybe makes satire, but you're still referring to the certain convention. Language is also a tool to think through. We think through images, we think through text, and we try to enable people to, to give them an instrument to think through this instrument. We help them to find out what they are thinking about, how they perceive the world, and we try to make them teach how they really see. Do they see what they see? Do they see what is there? Do they see what is there or how they think about it? Mm. And from that on, if you realize that, then you give them certain tools, like you just have to know these kind of tools, classical tools you mm. taught already 20 or 50 or 60 years ago. Um, Bauhaus introduced a lot of those. And you can work with those, what we basically give, give them the tools to articulate their thinking. Because I've Everybody, I think maybe I will mention it on Wednesday, but everybody has dreams. Everybody is good at something. You mentioned it, that you have to know what you talk about very, very well in order to make it interesting. But you also have to know how to talk about it. And maybe that is what we try to teach in a certain way. I can tell nobody what to talk about, but maybe a little bit help, give them a little hand to say how to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe uh, mainstream and independent are, uh, anyway, terms that do not matter anymore at this level because it's just about giving shape to your perception of, of the world and helping people to, to get their ideas into this specific kind of, uh, of subjectivity and of uh, material shape mm. that they need. Sure. Uh, well, I think we might be able to take a few questions. It's 7.30. So maybe a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone.
you have to spend a bit of time to you know learn any kind of skill a lot of people i know who have sort of gotten into comics uh, have sort of done it on their own uh, they've just uh, sort of been interested i personally started drawing comics very late in life uh, i had an animation background but i never sort of uh, did comics so i think i uh, just it's an interest in storytelling is important uh, or uh, i think that that's the basic uh, fundamental thing that you need to be you, you need to want to tell stories and uh, uh, like i said a lot of people who actually got into comics uh, started reading you know uh, reading comics first you know by different people so just to be aware of what's happening around in the comic space just keep yourself abreast of uh, uh, what's going on um, and attempt to draw i mean you know that that's the only way you have to try otherwise <laughs> it it doesn't happen I think that's the that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs>
I'm just thinking, there's a great creator, I, I'm from Toronto, there's a great creator who does amazing social justice work around gendered violence, and one of her Twitter posts recently, she's called Frizz Kid, one of her Twitter posts was, um, you know, this is a kind of note about all of the people who steal my work, replicate my work, and some of, unfortunately, some of those people are likely educators who use it as a teaching tool without giving credit. Not suggesting those are things you do, but what's the responsibility of educators when using um, creative work as a pedagogical tool? Creative work of others. Yes. <laughs> creative work, we'll just say that. Work that creators do. It's a complicated question, it's okay. Yes, because you said, I have to show examples. I have to show what other people do and then talk about it. And sometimes it's very difficult. If I really build it in into something, sometimes I try to get in touch with somebody. But I must confess, there are people who do wonderful work and I quote them without never have having asked them. Not because I don't want to give them credit, I I say who it was, I say where they can look it up because I always give hints and that just try to direct them in a certain direction. On the other hand, I have, for instance, students with those issues and they come and want to do a project about it. And I found out that out, even if you work or think or a subject is what you call outside mainstream, it also has a convention within its own. And <laughs> They also have their own cliches, and that's what we try to help them to, to do something good or to do something well. You have to gain a certain distance. You can't it really do from within. It's my personal perception. So we help them also to go a little bit out of the subject, take a certain distance, not do it only about themselves, but because if you do something about yourself, about your griefs, about your pain or whatever it is, you need a lot of practice, I think, in order to face the problems you will face, the abysses as you might fall into. And it's also our duty to protect them from that. They can do it much later, but I think not during their studies. But whenever whatever subject they, they choose, they're absolutely free to choose whatever subject. We try to help them and guide them also through, and it's a common teacher's tool, show what other people have done and where they come from. And some people have been self-taught. I had tell them from the very beginning on, you don't have to come to school. It just helps you to come faster to conclusions. And not everybody has the stamina and the critical eye to really improve just by him or herself. I'm just going to, uh, is there, are there more questions? Otherwise, I'd just like to make another point, which is that, see, till now we've also been speaking about the comic book or the graphic novel within the space of uh, the creators, the readers, and so on. Um, there is also another space, uh, which uh, is when the comic book is kind of used as uh, some an object of study. So for instance, I don't know whether that is also something you were alluding to, but let's say a text such as uh, Persepolis, right? I mean, this is something that is taught in, uh, I you know, in, in, in our university as a text, you know? Um, I'm not sure whether we can go into a discussion of that here, but that there is also that other life, you know, where the comic book becomes an object of study, you know? And uh, well, the only thing that I can say in that regard is that we are planning towards something uh, uh, perhaps a symposium where we can take that up. You know, it, it's a little, it's probably going to happen early next year. But uh, this is something that we've been uh, deeply concerned about and, and not just the ethics of use. Because uh, I would like to respond to you by saying that the academic space can claim some immunity to it because there isn't a commercial use of that, quote unquote. You know, I mean, not that the academic space is a free space. Uh, I mean, I get paid for teaching. I don't. I don't do it for free. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the same time, it's not quite the same as taking images from a particular work and using it in another commercial project. I mean, that's a completely different ball game. And as yeah. one very small footnote, I saw Sharad's work and uh, found it fantastic. And so it took a few years, but then I could invite him to Switzerland. So some of these people then become part of the academic of the institution. And that's one possibility to show our estimation. Um, I think we might be able to take one last question if there is one. No. Great. So 
we wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, we barely got a chance to meet just before getting on stage, so I'd like to thank each one of you. I think we managed to pull off quite an engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.